welcome you to Great Bridge United Methodist Church. My name is Will Montgomery, the lead pastor here, and it's a joy to welcome everyone who is here in the sanctuary as well as those who are worshiping online. Pastor Devin is not with us today. She is preaching with someone that many of us know very well. Pastor Tim uh, is, uh, we all know is at Virginia Beach United Methodist Church. He is on vacation, and so he, uh, Devin, is preaching uh, in that church today. And so prayers for that church and for Devin uh, as she uh, preaches there this morning. Before we begin our worship, I do invite you to stand and greet one another in the name of Christ. So good to see you. Bless you. Good to see you. I just have a couple of announcements that I want to bring to your attention as before we begin our worship. One is that we would like for people to register your attendance, and you can do that by using that perforated part of your uh, bulletin and then put, put that in the offering plate when it's passed around. Or if you want to go to the website, you can, you can click on an event there and, and register your attendance that way. For those who are visiting with us or our guests today, we're so glad that you're here. If you'd like to provide any information that we might contact you, with, contact you we'd love for, to, to do that. And also we have uh, a mug and some coffee in the back uh, in the foyer if, you're, uh, if you'd like to get one of those when you leave. We certainly welcome you to do that. Also, want to let you know that this Wednesday we're having our Beyond Sunday event. It begins at 545. There's a dinner there with chicken and rice, and we'd like for you to let us know that you're coming. You can register on that same page that you register your attendance. And there's a, So that will be this uh, Wednesday at 545. There's a mini retreat uh, that Pastor Devin is offering called What Was I Made For? It's on May 3rd and 4th. You can learn more about that in the bulletin and also on the website. Tonight we're having pie with the pastors, and it's going to be taking place in the table. For those who are not where the table is, but if you go to the entrance outside of the church office and take a left and go down the hallway, you'll find the table on, on the right. I'll be there, and it will be a wonderful time of gathering together to learn more about the church. Maybe you have questions about what does it mean to be a member, or how do I become a member? And so we welcome people to come and to be part of that. If you haven't registered for that, you're still welcome to come and, and take part. And so that's again at 7 o'clock tonight uh, at the table. Let us now prepare our hearts to worship. Let us pray.
Good morning. Good morning. Would you stand, please, and join me in the call to worship, which is found in your bulletin and on the screens behind me. I'll read the lighter text, and you please read the bold. Come to Christ, that living stone, rejected by the world, but in God's sight, chosen and precious. We have your Father in Christ's fall, and we seek to be built into a spiritual house, a living reminder of God's presence among us. Once we were no people, but now we are God's people, called out of the darkness into God's marvelous light. Therefore, we sing with church in, the church in all ages, Blessed be your name, O God, our Redeemer. By your mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Please remain standing for opening hymn, which is called We Are God's People. It's number 2220 in the Faith We Sing booklet, and the words should be on the screen behind me. Please remain standing as we share the Apostles' Creed. You can find it on page 881 in the hymnal or follow along on the screens behind me. Uh, following the Creed, we will sing the Gloria Patri. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please be seated. Would you join me in the opening prayer this morning? The words are found in your bulletins and also on the screens. Let us pray. O oh God, our guide and guardian, you have led us apart from the busy world into the quiet of your house. Grant us grace to worship you in spirit and in truth to the comfort of our souls, and to the upbuilding of every good purpose and holy desire. Enable us to do more perfectly the work to which you have called us, that we may not be fear the coming night when we shall resign into your hands the tasks which you have committed to us. So may we worship you not with our lips at this hour, but in word and deed, all the days of our life, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. At this time, I invite the children to come forward for children's time. You can sit right here in the front, that'd be great. Well, good morning. I am so glad that you are here as we have our time together, as we share in this moment. Today, I'm going to be talking about the word tradition. Can you say tradition? Tradition. What is a tradition? Anyone have an idea? It's stuff that different families do. Yes, stuff that different families do. Right. And so when we talk about Christmas traditions, there are things that our families do. What are some things that we might do at Christmas? We might put up a Christmas tree. Well, that's a tradition. We might watch certain movies. Well, that's a tradition. What do you do at birthday, on your birthday? Have cake. have cake. Why do we have cake? Hmm, you're, you're right. It is we have cake. Why do we have cake? Because it's your birthday, right. So it kind of goes right back. Yeah, it's our birthday. It's distinguished as a special day. And one reason why we have cake is because, well, our parents, or maybe they, they bought the cake or they made the cake, and it's a way of celebrating our birthday. Where did they learn that from? Jesus, right? Jesus has a birthday. We celebrate Christmas, but yes. And so we learn it from generations and generations. So a tradition is that which is passed down many times through our families, but also through the church family. And so it's a belief that's passed down. There are practices that are passed down. Why do we have children's moment right now? Hmm. It wasn't my idea. It was Jesus' idea to have gather all around the kids, all the gather around and share together. But it's an idea that has been part of the church for a long time. And so we share in that rich tradition of sharing the gospel, sharing the story with children because it's so important that we share God's love, that we share Jesus' love with each generation. And so we as children are here to learn and to share. And when, as you get older, guess what you get to do? You get to celebrate that love. You're already celebrating that love. And that's keeping up the tradition of sharing Christ's love in this place. And so I'm thankful for the many traditions. Can you say tradition? traditions that we have in the life of the church, even worshiping at 11 o'clock hour is a tradition that's been handed down for a long, long time. We don't even question why 11 o'clock and not 10 o'clock or other times, but it's something that has shaped why we do what we do. When we do communion, we do it once a month. Why? 
That's part of our tradition. Though we probably could have it every single Sunday and have a new tradition of doing that. And so a lot of things that we do in life at church is because of tradition. And because we want to share Christ's love and we, and we want to make it special. Just like on our birthdays, it's special to have a cake and have presents. That's part of what we do. And so I want to celebrate the traditions that we have that have been given to us. And then we get to pass that on to other generations too. Let's put our hands together and be in prayer. Dear God, we give you thanks for your love for us. And we give you thanks for the story in the Bible that is handed down to us. Help us to cherish the stories, to live these stories out as we receive the traditions of love. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for coming up. You can go to Children's Church now. The answer to a question in church, Jesus is always the right answer. <laughs> Here now the Old Testament lesson from Deuteronomy 6. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me with to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life, and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you, so that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord your God of your ancestors has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Sorry, I missed a hymn. <laughs> uh, please stand, if you would, and, uh, and join me in the number 577, God of Grace and God of Glory.
You may be seated. Now our epistle lesson is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. But we must always give thanks to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits of salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For this purpose he called you through our proclamation of the good news, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. And now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope. Comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come. Move freely among us, we pray. Lead the meditations in our hearts and minds. May they be acceptable in your sight. As we discern and ponder what it means to be your church. As we seek to be open to your Holy Spirit leading us onward. Come Holy Spirit, come we pray. Amen. Tradition. If you have watched the Masters the last three days or will watch it this afternoon, you will certainly hear that word perhaps more than once, a tradition unlike any other we hear. In the musical Fiddler on the Roof, one of the most well-known songs is about the roles and expectations of different people within the family unit. And each stanza is followed by the refrain of the word that the choir is going to sing for us, right? Tradition, thank you, yes, tradition. (laughs) Singing it over and over again. And if I ask about one of your family's traditions, chances are you'll speak of the time-honored Christmas traditions that have guided your experience of Christmas and, and given you meaning in the sharing. We speak of a traditional worship service. We also speak of a contemporary worship service, as if the contemporary service doesn't have any traditions. But if a contemporary service has a few weeks of going, guess what? They develop a tradition. They develop certain uh, movement and expectations. So traditions are important. And we have them. We have them in our homes. We have them in our schools. We have them in the church. We keep them in our communities in which we live. We love our traditions. Many of the traditions that we have are very sacred to us. Some of the traditions that we inherited, we we let go. But there's power in keeping and sharing and living and passing down the traditions. The Israelites knew how important it was for the next generation to learn the story of God delivering the Israelites from the bondage of slavery And during the Passover meal, it's customary for the youngest to ask the questions. And the questions are called the manis tana, asking why is this night different than other nights? The invitation is there with a question to then share the story. And children learn the importance of asking questions and learning their story Parents and grandparents take joy in sharing the story, a story that has shaped the people from generation to generation. It is a night of remembrance and the night of sharing traditions that have long shaped the people. And it was during that meal of remembrance, that traditional Passover meal, When Jesus took wine and bread, instead of offering the typical words of remembering their story, he offered new words. And today when we share in Holy Communion as we have the last two Sundays, we're not just doing it because it's a tradition of the church, but it's a way of remembrance. It's a way of celebrating the very presence of Christ in our midst. In our Old Testament lesson, we heard the Shema, and included in the Shema is the command to love God with all of who you are and the encouragement to keep the commandments of God. 
And not just to keep the commandments of God in our hearts, but to do what? To recite them to your children and talk about them when you're home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise, meaning talk about them all the time. And the power of the words of the story comes not just with the story, what the story's about, though there's great power in the fact that these stories are about God's deliverance and God's love, but it's also in sharing. And sharing to the next generation, there's power in sharing what we know with others. You cease to share. You cease to pass down. And the story goes away and gets lost. Time-honored traditions, they are taught. And the stories that go with it, that's true in our families. It is important to teach the next generation the family stories that reveal character and courage and perseverance. I loved as a child sitting at the adult table to listen to my grandparents tell their stories. And those stories lend itself to the new hearing of the next generation, stories that reveal, yes, you're going to face obstacles, but you will survive. Stories that reveal that you're not the only ones who are going through a difficult time. You will get through this. You know, same is true in great visionary companies that retain core values as the company will shift with the new CEO or shift with new products as they're keeping up with the changing times. And these values are part of the tradition that are handed down. And so great visionary companies are built to last because they, can, they thrive through generations to next generations because they know their story. The products may change, but they know their story and they know who they are. Jim Collins writes that such companies continually remind themselves of the crucial distinction between core and not non-core, between what, is, what should never change and what is open to change, between what is sacred and what is not. Tradition does not mean we keep doing things we've always done because that's our tradition. The church may cease to exist or be relevant by holding on to traditions for the sake of holding on to traditions if we're not open to the Holy Spirit leading us to offer fresh expressions of our old-time religion. Perhaps you've heard the most common phrase uttered in a church in decline is, we have never done it that way before. Or we have always done it this way. Traditions kept for the sake of traditions may hold form, but if we're not careful, can lose substance and the meaning behind them, robbing them of the true power if we're simply carrying them out without much thought, without much care, and without much attention. Perhaps you're familiar with the story of a person preparing to soak a country ham in a large pot, and she saws off the bone and asks why she does that each time. She says, well, that's what I learned from my mother. She always did it, and so that's how I do it today. Ask the mother then why she saws off the end of the bone before soaking in a pot. Well, that's what I watched my mom do all those years, and if it was good enough for her and worked for her, well, that's just the way you are to prepare a country ham. Well, let's ask grandma then. Why did you saw off the bone and the end of the ham each time you soaked it? Well, that's the way I watched my mom do it all those years. And if it worked for her and the ham always tastes good, it must work. Well, let's say we could ask great-grandmother then. Why did you saw off the ham and the end of the, bone, end of the ham before soaking it in the pot? And great-grandmother says this. Well, I had a small pot. And that's the only way it was going to fit. And so through the years, the tradition was handed down without much thought, not questioning why you were doing that. Just It didn't make any sense to do it, but you just did it anyway. It was something that had always been done, even when the next generations had what? Larger pots. And so today, as we are talking about Methodist toolbox, and last week we talked about Scripture, we're talking about another resource in our toolbox 
tradition. It's another source to help guide us in our theological task, in our theological undertaking. And as we discern what it means to be to think about God and, and the way of Jesus, our faith, and what it means to be church, what it means to be Christian, what it means to be, in particular, United Methodist, I'm not inviting us to consider the importance of just keeping up time-honored traditions without much thought. Rather, I'm inviting us to give careful consideration of our past, of our story, of our history, and discover that there's something rich and packed with meaning in those traditions that are handed down. And if we can somehow reclaim those disciplines and practices and understandings of how God was at work so long ago, if we can make sure that they're still in our practices today, we will be better off as we seek to renew them and go forward into uncharted territories. And when I say uncharted territories for the church and for Christians, it means that the landscape before us in seeking to be church is greatly different from what we've just gone through and the way we've done church for decades. Why? We are in a post-pandemic season, and the church coming out of the pandemic is very different, or not very different, but somewhat different than the church going into it, and in our denomination, 25% of United Methodists have left the denomination with the start of a new one in the past year. So many of the tools and traditions and structures that have served us well, we may need to let go of as we adapt, as we move forward with courage, taking with us, however, that which is essential. And what is essential? The gospel story of Jesus Christ, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, the biblical stories that have shaped our faith, the faith that's been handed down from one generation to the next, the Wesleyan emphasis on small groups, personal and social holiness, the desire to grow as Christians, to be more like Christ tomorrow than we are today. We are to carry with us the, that which has been handed down to us and that which we deem ultimately essential, and we are to carry that into our uncharted territories. In the United Methodist Church, we have our traditions, and I'm not talking, uh, the, and other denominations have them as well. Even non-denominations, guess what? They have traditions too. Every church has traditions. And when I talk about traditions, I'm not talking about worship, traditional worship but I'm talking about our history and how in our denomination, theological pluralism has existed from the beginning. Ashley Dreff, in her book, Entangled, writes theological pluralism is best understood as a living and dynamic theological tradition in which five distinct languages are spoken, including evangelicalism, radicalism, ecumenism, liberalism, and Wesleyanism. And after the sermon, there will be a test. <laughs> Theological pluralism was the solution to allowing multiple histories and theolo theologies to do what? To coexist within the Methodist church, to coexist in one denomination. And yet it unknowingly allowed these histories and theologies to develop into concrete ideologies. And when we lift up one ideology over another, it's almost as if you have no room here anymore. Because I have my ideology and everything else has got to go. Or it's way down here. We are a church with a long history. A long tradition of evangel evangelism on the one hand. And on the other hand, a long tradition of social justice, social reform. And these two histories have existed simultaneously and has served the church well. And because of this, we have members leading us forward and sharing the gospel. Not just pastors, but people saying, you know what? It is so important to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to offer that saving grace, and to witness people 
People's lives change as they come to understand who Jesus is. While we also have others in the church who are saying it's so vitally important that we take Jesus out to where people are on the margins to include those who are often excluded and seek to reform society and do the work of justice. Holding on to these traditions is one of the reasons why we find ourselves at a crossroads when it comes to something like human sexuality. For these two traditions that have served us well, they don't always mesh when they become ideologies. And now we feel that one has to win out. It's an either or. When I believe that we are at our best, when we have a both-and approach, and these traditions can continue to serve us as we proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in word, sign, and deed, as we seek to love God and love our neighbors. Even though the landscape before us is different than what is behind us. This isn't the first time we've been challenged with discerning the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst. For there is a great link between our day and time and that with the early church. And the link, yes, there's the scripture which is the link, but the link is the history and the tradition of the church passed down from generation to generation. Ted Campbell, in writing about the interpretive role of tradition, states, we are called to value God's own work throughout the story of God's people and to take courage and confidence in the faithfulness of God, speaking to us in traditions beyond the witness of the biblical story and see how the Holy Spirit has been at work throughout. In the Book of Discipline, which is our book that that guides our polity and shares our history, we read Christianity doesn't take a giant leap from the New Testament to the present as though nothing is to be learned from the great cloud of witnesses in between. And thank God for those witnesses. For centuries, Christians have sought to interpret the truth of the gospel for their time. And we are called to do that today in our time and our place to share and to live out the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank God for that passing down from generation to generation. In many ways, you are Christian or are seeking to know Christ because someone in your past cared deeply for you, enough for you to share the story, to share the story of God's saving grace in Jesus Christ. And they pass on that story to you of God's love, and they encourage you then to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And so thank God for this passing down from one person to the next, from one generation to the next, as faith continually, as faith certainty, faith certainly comes to us by the sharing, by our talking, by our hearing of the good news of Jesus. Together we receive this passing down of faith and practices through generations. And yet what is passed down is not always perfect. It's not always good. Sometimes it's a mixture of good and the not so good as a church struggles to understand what does it mean to be faithful in our time and place? What does it mean to be faithful? As sometimes the church can lose out when they're complacent or misled by zeal or outright lies. As I mentioned last week, when it comes to our interpretation of Scripture, sometimes I get it wrong. In the same way, the church hasn't always got it right. In my home church, lots of churches in that town have wonderful Christian education wings. And I grew up in those Christian education wings, enjoying the Sunday school experience and the vacation Bible school. And it wasn't until later in life that I learned why every church in that town had wonderful education wings. Why? It's because when they decided to close the schools, 
the church has got together and say, you know what, we all build these buildings. We can house our children to go to school when the public schools are closed. The church didn't get it right. Racism was winning out for decades. The church didn't get it right. See, not all traditions are good traditions. When the Methodist church split over the issue of slavery and long after the nation came back together, it took another 70 years for the Methodist church to once again be united. And why did it take so long? Because for 70 years, people recalled the hurt and the animosity toward the other. And it took 70 years for healing and renewal to take place. And it took a generation not bound by all the hurtful past to move forward. It's a part of our history and hopefully we will learn from this as we face uncertainties. As we discover a way forward with God, even as many churches and pastors have left to join the Global Methodist Church in the past year. We are repeating history yet again. So when we look back using tradition as a source, we have to be careful not to glorify it or try to reclaim all parts of it. As scripture can be the norm by which all traditions are judged, sometimes the traditions are found wanting in need of redemption. And sometimes we're called then to confess our collective sin, admit where we have erred, and seek to start anew. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, he didn't seek to start out a new denomination. That was not his purpose. It wasn't his idea. Martin Luther didn't set out, he didn't say one day, you know what, I'm going to create this whole new movement called the Protestant Reformation. That's not what he was about. He was trying to do what? He was calling the Catholic Church, go back. Remember who we are and reform it. Both were looking to reform, and they were calling the church to go back, not just to the traditions that you inherited, but go further back. Go to the apostolic roots, to the apostolic faith, the early church. For John Wesley, he wanted to renew the Church of England, and one of the ways he sought to do this was to go back to the early church and see how do they live out their faith. Methodism was a revival of the apostolic faith that is expressed where? In the scriptures. And what do we find? What do we find in the early church? That Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And so as John Wesley and others started this movement, this became the model for how he was going to live in community living a new method, which is actually a pretty old method that had been lost. Creating societies and bands and classes, we would call them Sunday school classes or small groups where people would do what? Where they would gather together and hold each other accountable in the way you're seeking to live out your faith. And they would watch over each other in love, encouraging one another to live out your faith in dynamic and practical ways. It's not just a Sunday morning thing. It is an everyday kind of faith. And he renewed. He renewed the love feast. He renewed watch night services filled with prayer and people coveting together. And he challenged the people called Methodists to spread scriptural holiness across the land. In our day and time, as we're facing uncertainty, and these times are changing, what would we do well to do? We would do well to remember our roots, to stay connected to traditions started in the early church and rediscovered by those early Methodists. In seeking to renew this in our church today, perhaps we could in some way, yes, the church might be changing, but how can we experience renewal? And dare I say it, can I say it here? Revival? (laughs) Can I dare say that we could experience a revival 
going on here as we take seriously the message of the good news of Jesus Christ, as we take seriously the sharing of that story to the next generation, to sharing the love of God with all children, that we would be formed ourselves in small groups where we watch over each other in love, daring one another to move out of your comfort zones as we have a tendency to stay there and go walk with Jesus on a regular basis. See, I, I want us to take risks, not for the sake of the church, but for the sake of those who have yet to come and for the sake of those who have become complacent and too comfortable with holding on to the status quo. Because sometimes, friends, the status quo is failing and the status quo is not working. There's no time like the present to be open to be open to the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit, bringing not new things, but bringing forth something new from something so very old as we seek to move forward in faith. As I think about the interpretive role of tradition and where we are in the Methodist Church in America, I'm reminded of the prophetic words from John Wesley as he offered them toward the end of his life. He says, I am not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America, but I am afraid that they should only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power. And this will undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast the discipline, the spirit, and the doctrine for which they first set out. Friends, what are you willing? What are you willing to renew in your life? What are you willing to reclaim in your life? Is it a deeper prayer life? Is it being more intentional about worshiping as a family? Is it more about going into the scriptures and taking that deeper dive? Is it participating in a small group or having a greater witness to, to move from a, a consumer mindset? What is the church doing for me as opposed to what can I do in helping share the story in the life of the church? Picking up the cross and following in the way of Jesus. What do you seek to take with you that has served you well but what are you also willing to let go of as we move forward in faith? There's no time like today to renew all traditions that serve us well so that we might experience more of God bringing forth renewal in our faith, in our church, in the community in which we live. And as we go forth, we go forth standing firm on the rich traditions, the cloud of witnesses who are there cheering us on as we go forth for God and with God. May it be so in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
invite us now to go to God in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we do give you thanks for those who have gone before us, for those who have shared the gospel story with us. People in our family, people in our churches, people in our neighborhoods, people who just simply cared, cared enough for us to share the story and that we might come to know you as the one who brings forth salvation in Jesus Christ. For Lord, we are thankful for what has gone before us and we ask your Holy Spirit to lead us as we move forward in faith, as we seek to be obedient, as we seek to be open, as we seek to be guided and led by your Spirit, that we might truly be the church you're calling us to be as we carry the traditions, as we take with us the scriptures and seek to live by them. Guide us, we pray. We can't do this on our own. We need your Holy Spirit. We trust in your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we come before you, we pray for each person on our prayer list and those that we name in our hearts before you. Where there's brokenness and disease, we look to you as the great physician and ask for your healing. And we ask this boldly in the precious name and the powerful name of Jesus. Where there are those who are in isolation and experiencing loneliness, we do pray that they might be comforted and that we might be the ones who reach out in love. Lord, we pray for our church. We pray for delegates as they're preparing to come from around the world to Charlotte beginning in two weeks. Be with them as they continue to come together and as they seek your guiding hand and your wisdom. We do pray for your Holy Spirit to move. And Lord, we pray for the world and that is experiencing so much brokenness and war. We pray, O oh Lord, for the people of Israel and the people of Palestine. And as the tensions mount, we do pray, O oh Lord, that leaders from around the world would come together and seek your wisdom and dare to be ambassadors of peace. But we be with those who live in those anxious times and those anxious places, we pray. The Lord, continue to be with your church as we move forward through the ages in that unbroken line as we seek to be your church. And Lord, we offer this in the blessed name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite the ushers to come forward as we share now an offering of tithes and gifts. In addition to placing an offering in the offering place, you may also go to the website. If you prefer to give electronically, you can find ways to give online as well. Let us pray. Lord, for the gift of this day, for the gift of this time, for the gift of worship, for the gift of gathering together as brothers and sisters who share a great love for you. Use these gifts always to bring glory to you as we seek to be your church, as we seek to uh, glorify you in this hour of worship, and as we seek to glorify you in the way that we live out our faith and serve others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Could you remain standing for our closing hymn, Forward Through the Ages, number 555 in your hymnal. joy to be able to share together a love for God as we as brothers and sisters in Christ have come into this place to worship our Lord and now we go out into the world and we continue to love God as we seek to love our neighbors as well and so may we be that church willing to share the gospel story willing to live it out and willing to love all our neighbors that we can share the love of Christ with go forth and may you be at peace in the name of the Father Son and Holy Spirit Amen.